hacer la interpretación uh, en español haciendo clic en interpretation en la parte inferior uh, de la pantalla y selección, sele, seleccionando Spanish. Um, uh, se parece como un globo y ahí puedes seleccionar uh, um, español. Ok. And then, so very briefly about the ACLU and our indigenous justice work. Um, the ACLU of Northern California de defends and advances justice, fairness, equality, and freedom through legal um, and policy organizing and communications. We seek to protect and advance civil liberties for all Californians. Um, the ACLU of Northern California acknowledges that all land in what is known as the United States, including the areas um, where the ACLU of Northern California works is unceded indigenous territory. This land has been stewarded by indigenous people since time immemorial. We recognize the urgent need to promote and advance the inherent rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, we strive to follow the lead of indigenous peoples, communities, organizations, and movements. Um, we support and advance tribal sovereignty and the rights of indigenous peoples and the dismantling of colonial systems of oppression. Um, we endeavor to honor and when possible, integrate indigenous worldviews and values into our approaches and strategies. Um, and one of my colleagues will drop um, some information to understand what land you are on and how you can uh, show up for indigenous peoples today. Uh, next slide. So throughout the program, you're more than welcome to um, drop some uh, messages of encouragement in the chat, as well as um, any questions. Um, depending on time, we, we may have some time for Q&A, but um, yeah, so <laughs> we'll get through that once, once we um, explore the program a bit more. And so next slide. Yeah, so here's just some general Zoom safety information. You cannot rename yourself. Um, at this time, I think chat may be open um, and you can't uh, unmute yourself, yourself um, so as not to interrupt our speakers. Next slide. So um, my name is Josefa Vega. I'm an organizer with the ACLU of NorCal. I'm based in Fresno and I operate out of the Fresno office. And I'll go ahead and pre present um, our speakers today. So first, we are joined by Morningstar Gali, who is a member of the Achumawi Band of the Pitt River Tribe located in Northeastern California. She serves as Project Director for Restoring Justice for Indigenous Peoples and as the California Tribal and Community Liaison um, for International Indian Treaty Council, working for the sovereignty and self-determination of Indigenous Peoples and recognition and protection of Indigenous rights treaties, traditional cultures, sacred lands. Um, she's also the tribal water policy organizer for Save California Salmon, uh, dedicated to raising awareness and visibility within the unique climate of California's urban and rural native communities. Gali coordinates, um, coordinates support of indigenous led organizing efforts. Ms. Gali continues to lead large scale actions while coordinating native culture, spiritual, scholarly and political gatherings throughout California. She is deeply committed to advocating for indigenous sovereignty issues such as missing and murdered indigenous women, MMIW, uh, climate justice, gender justice and sacred sites protection on behalf of the tribal and in intertribal communities in which she was raised. Prior to returning to her ancestral homelands and working for her tribe, she served as volunteer and advocate on behalf of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated indigenous peoples in California, uh, while working with a number of indigenous led grassroots organizations in the Bay Area for over two decades. She serves on a number of advisory committees that advocate uh, for the sovereignty and self-determination of California's indigenous peoples and sacred landscapes. Since 2008, Morningstar has been a rotating host on KPFA 94.1's um, Bay Native Circle and is a proud mother of four children. So give it up in your reactions and chat if you're able to um, for Morningstar. And I'll take a moment um, to introduce our other speaker, 
uh, Lisa V. Felix. Um, she's the operations manager for Restoring Justice for Indigenous Peoples. Um, Lisa is leading us into a deeper discussion of what the impact of MMIWP has on future generations. She is a member of the Pitt River Nation Achumawi um, Band in Northern California. Lisa is increasingly turning her focus into raising awareness for indigenous concerns in her own community and throughout California. She advocates through sport, um, running the annual 500 mile American Indian spiritual marathon and education by, by facilitating the Cairo's Blanket Exercise Workshop with her sister Morningstar Galley. So give it up for our speakers. Um, and we could go ahead and jump to their presentation, Carlos. And I'll pass over the mic to RJIP. You all have the floor. Jimmy Sunwe, greetings all. It's nice to be here with all of you. Can you hear okay on my sound? I apologize. There's a little bit of background uh, music behind me. So if I need to speak up, just let me know. Um, I just wanna say that I am grateful to be here with all of you today. I am joining from unceded Nisanan, Miwok and Maidu tribal territories. Uh, we are Working on behalf of indigenousjustice.org is our uh, website where you can learn more information about our dedication to um, uplifting the stories and visibility of California's indigenous peoples. That's who we are and how we support uh, women and youth within the carceral system. I say that 100% of our youth are considered system impacted due to the history of colonization due to our experiences um, within boarding schools, the ongoing foster care system, um, that this has had an effect on, on all of our Native youth. And so in that, recognizing the disparities, recognizing that Native peoples have an 87% recidivism rate, when they are released, um, our work is, is dedicated to supporting, highlighting, um, sharing community organizing practices that are grounded in our traditional and, and cultural practices. So um, thank you for joining us and I'll turn it over to Lisa for her to introduce herself. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Felix. I'm the operations manager for Restoring Justice for Indigenous Peoples. I'm also the joy manager, so I've been told. Um, thank you so much for having us. Um, it really is an honor and a privilege to be here to speak with all of you today. Uh, I just joined this uh, amazing work um, last November. So it's been a thrill and a joy to be part of all of the the work, um, boots on the ground, and um, we are definitely um, two busy people, and um, we hope to share with you more what we have going on um, as we share our time with you today. Thanks so much. So with that, we could go to the next slide, please. Yes, Joy Manager is so important in this work. Um, I'll just share a bit that some of what we do is that um, there are 12 to 15 families that have been just throughout Northern California that have been impacted uh, through the ongoing epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women, missing and murdered indigenous relatives, um, all inclusive of our two-spirit non-binary um, and trans relatives that it is important to include um, all of our relatives that have been affected uh, by, by this crisis and the epidemic. Um, last uh, spring, we held an event here in Sacramento. It was a river walk event where we hosted uh, those 12 to 15 families. We walked from Sutter's Landing and had a march to Sutter's Fort. We, you know, still in the midst of the pandemic, we planned to host 200 people that day, and we ended up having a turnout of over 600 relatives. And so I think that just really speaks to the impact 
um, and you know on ongoing efforts in terms of supporting the families and what justice looks like for them and what the healing um, efforts look like for them as well. And so there we go. Thank you for sharing. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So California Indian women and girls are going missing and being murdered at exponentially increasing rates. Over half of these cases documented have occurred within the last three years. Um, the rate of MMIWNG cases per year statewide has increased by approximately 20% in 2016. The rate of cases increased over tenfold. And in 2018, the rate increased by another 250%, representing a total increase of over 850% within the last five years. Just yesterday, I met with the State Department of Justice, uh, Director of Native American Affairs, and Chairman James from Yurok Tribe. Yurok Tribe recently issued a state of emergency um, for their tribe. Redding Rancheria has also followed suit. And so there is a plan by the DOJ. Um, there was legislation that was put forward by Assemblyman Ramos's office this past summer, which will allocate $5 million in funding um, for resources provided to, to tribes um, in terms of, of supporting their MMIW and MMIP cases. Um, but we need immediate responses. We need immediate support. I think that there's a lot of uh, misinformation that's out there, a lot of people don't know that within the state of California that you do not have to wait 48 hours to re to report your loved one missing, that you can, um, even if the loved one or friend, family friend, um, whatever the relationship may be, um, if you were out of the state of California, um, you know, there are states that have different rules, Arizona, uh, for example, you do have to wait the 48 hours, but many people don't know that within California that you can immediately report um, whether it is a, a juvenile or adult um, in terms of them going missing. I think one of the barriers that uh, we really have faced is that the information may not be taken seriously, right? So we contact law enforcement, let them know that the individual is missing and what we have found in a lot of the reporting and a lot of the mainstream news coverage, if there is coverage at all, that there is a lot of victim blaming of Native women. There is a lot of victim blaming and finger pointing of what is it that they did to get themselves into the situation, um, rather than looking at it as, as a systemic issue, which it is. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So this is uh, the data, this just shows a quick overview of the data sources. So this is pulled from the Urban Indian Health Institute report um, on MMIW cases within urban areas. Um, and so as you see, um, you know, the trend of what was reported in the media, what was reported by city police, and then what was actually reported um, by family members, by community members um, in the UIHI data. Can we go to the next slide, please? So here is, um, if you are familiar at all with um, the uh, epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women and peoples, this is the stats um, that are pretty general and that have been provided um, where it shows that the lack of communication between state, local, and tribal law enforcement, that it's difficult to begin the investigation process. We um, in California are a public law 280 state. And so that creates a lot of uh, jurisdictional questions. Um, and so a lot of times, again, there's that education piece, um, especially around trespassing so local city and county um, law enforcement don't understand that they are actually uh, 
the ones tasked to address issues of, of trespassing, you know, whether it's on ranchery or reservation lands, they generally just don't want to touch the issue. Um, and, you know, we do definitely think that some of this information uh, in, in this data, um, so it shows that murder is the third leading cause of death for Indigenous women. I have seen some of the direct uh, reporting, uh, the data showing that, you know, for, for girls, um, for Native girls, that suicide is the second uh, highest cause of death. And again, that can be um, problematic in terms of who is reporting that data. Um, and then I think that, you know, where it shows that the 56% or they'll say one in three women and girls experience sexual violence. Um, I think those that's of what's reported, right? That's definitely not encompassing of all in that 86% of perpetrators are considered non-native and then on reservation areas that indigenous women are murdered at a rate that can be 10 times higher uh, than any other in ethnicity. Can we go to the next slide, please? So here are some of the uh, key stats that came from the reporting. So again, it just shows that 69% of victims who were in foster care are victims of sexual or domestic violence, that 41% of those um, experience sex trafficking or sex work, um, especially when they are uh, placed within those, those foster care environments and there is not protection for them. Um, so the history of the state of California and US generally, yes, so we can go back to the times of colonization within California, right? The times of the gold rush and of missionization. Um, the first ones to traffic are our native peoples um, were the US soldiers, right? We can talk about how California as a state was founded on state-sponsored genocide where there was um, millions of dollars that was provided as bounties to bring, um, to physically bring our, our heads and our scalps in for payment. And so many uh, gold prospectors arrived believing that they were going to immediately get rich off of the gold rush. And um, in turn, they ended up, uh, you know, it found that it was easier to be a bounty hunter, that it was more profitable to be a bounty hunter. And so, you know, a lot of what uh, the education that we provide around um, you know, I call it like California Indian 101, where we explain that what, why California is so unique. Um, California Indian peoples, we have the 18 uh, treaties that are unratified. We have over 100 tribes that are considered federally recognized, but we have over 50 tribes that are considered NFR, non-federally recognized throughout California. We have state recognized, we have terminated tribes, we have um, disenfranchised, many disenfranchised tribal peoples that have been disenrolled or disenfranchised from their tribal lands. Um, that means that they are not eligible for educational benefits and, and for healthcare. Um, and so all of that's very political. We look at the Bay Area, we look at the LA uh, basin, you know, metropolitan areas where uh, the land is considered prime real estate. And so those are areas if you were to overlay a map and it shows, you know, the number of tribes that are not afforded federal recognition. It, it would be within those areas considered prime real estate because if you um, have recognition, then you need to have a land base. And so the state still, um, has not uh, fulfilled many of its treaty obligations. Um, and you know it, it turns into a, a very political issue where the federal government decides who is and who is not a native person. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? And so this shows by county area. And so you'll see within San Francisco, 
um, County, extremely high rates within Sacramento County, and then some of the uh, largest, the deepest red county areas there in Humboldt and Mendocino County. And so that's why the Yurok tribe, I believe it was also Elk Valley. Um, there's a number of those coastal tribes that have declared state of emergencies for their uh, tribal membership. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to pause here and invite Lisa on. Um, Lisa, a lot of the work that she does is directly in supporting MMIW and MMIR family members. And if Lisa can just speak to, um, you know, what that support looks like and how um, we support the families in, in navigating uh, their efforts to seek justice and healing. Thank you. So what we see here is what the main point of this particular information is. Um, there are many MMIR cases um, that are not logged in the in the in the database, and so um, that's really just enheartening. So the numbers that you see, it, it's the numbers that have been recorded. Um, there are many more that have not been. So we work directly with the families. Um, like she said earlier, you know, um, when, a, when, a, when a loved one goes missing, the first person they call, um, the family calls is Morningstar. And so we are um, completely immersed in um, the, the, the emotional distress and grief of what the families go through. And so with the missing loved one, that means that the extended family has to, if there's children involved, um, suddenly take in um, the children in addition to the children that you know, they may have. Um, many loved ones deal with the grief of the lost loved one in different ways. Maybe they might, um, you know, turn to alcohol or drugs and go into clinical depression. Um, so our direct support is supporting the family. So what is the aftermath? What is the residual destruction um, after um, one of these people goes missing? And that's what we're, kind of, we're working on now is how to support the families. We get calls for you know, food, housing, PG&E, um, um, just various different types of, it could be, um, anything to support, you know, the ba basic um, living needs and also supporting the children with whatever they may need as well. Um, we are currently um, really excited about this. Uh, we just got, we applied for a grant and we are in the, in the midst of the final approval stages for a wellness advocacy program. And what that does is, because um, right now what we have is we have, you know, a ton of families, you know, that are, that are sort of, I want to say stuck in their grief, you know, it's like we, we help sort of the day to day, the basic needs, but then what we're trying to do now is like, how do we help them with their healing journey? How do we get them out of their grief to, to be, you know, successful and, um, you know, just processing through, you know, this horrible thing that they've, they've gone through. I mean, it affects the entire family. And so we have a wellness adv advocacy program that will actually assist the person in, um, it could be a resume building. So how do we help them find a job? Um, job interviewing skills, now that a lot of interviews are on Zoom. Um, tutoring support for children. Um, oftentimes if the person has to, you know, go for a job, you know, and then the children, you know, are upset as well because of the loss of their mother or father or whatever the case may be, you know, there's counseling services, there's extra tutoring services um, to, to provide while the, the family member is looking for a job or going to a job, for instance. Um, another Another uh, thing that we're doing is financial support. So not only just supporting them with giving them money, but how to help them with budgeting, finances, building, um, 
building generational wealth as opposed to just always being in a state of uh, distress over not having enough money to pay for you know, their living expenses, as well as the, maybe the family members that they're helping to, to care for. And then intertwining all of this, those are just a few examples, but intertwining um, our ceremonies and traditions, traditional ways um, into the healing journey, such as um, singing, drumming, beating, dancing, cult, you know, uh, learning about cultural foods, healthy eating, uh, just providing spaces for ceremonial practices that we believe is just really key in, in the entire family unit's healing journey. Um, let me think of what else. Um, we're, we have some upcoming, the other thing is we do some, um, we're having some upcoming events. So, so when, the, when the person goes missing, they're lost three times. They're lost when their name is lost when they go missing. They're, when, when the public or, or whoever forgets about them or they're never found. And then the third time is in the media because how often do we hear about the missing person in the media, a missing indigenous person in the media? You think about it. Um, we recently held a press conference just to raise awareness that indigenous people aren't in the media. Um, and trying to get more, you know, just more, more publicized, you know, out there. And so it's really heartbreaking to the families. Um, what we also do, so with the events, we, we try to not just raise awareness about the issue, but to bring honor and re, um, memory to the missing person for the families. So it's, it gives time for the family members that are left behind to be able to be in ceremony. For instance, we had a family, um, a sister of, of a missing or murdered um, young lady that we took to, it was a prayer sunrise hike in Chula Vista. And it was absolutely beautiful. And it was literally picking her up, taking her there, driving her there, housing her, feeding her, bringing her to the, um, the prayer hike and ceremony and, and really doing the hike with her and having her, you know, pick sage and, and build an altar up there and just, just a real, a really nice, beautiful time of remembering her sister. And so those are just a few examples of kind of what we do to walk alongside um, are these families in their, in their healing journey. And, um, it can be, it can be, be really heart-wrenching. It can be really beautiful, can be really sad and, and, and really just, you know, all of us are affected. And so as we, as we kind of journey through, we just really want to see how we can additionally support them, um, towards healing and, and, and the, the grieving process. I'll also add the piece that, you know, traditional foods, mm -hmm. um, access to ceremony, access to bringing them to uh, the gravesite of their loved ones, um, holding vigils and memorials. We have a number of events that are coming up for May 5th, the National Day of MMIW Advocacy and Awareness and Action. Um, it really is about, you know, um, uplifting and supporting um, the families in, in telling their story on, on their own terms. And so um, it's through providing ribbon skirts. We have a number of jingle dresses that have been donated by our cultural coordinator. And so that when they come into spaces of, of healing and spaces of ceremony, that they are able to feel comfortable. And so that's having um, a traditional, you know, um, attire and regalia available for them so that they do feel comfortable in those spaces. Can we go to the next slide, please? So as you can see, we have um, ways for people to get involved. So for instance, for our um, 
our May 5th uh, event is coming up. It's going to be at San Francisco City Hall at 530. Really just um, we'll be promoting it on social media and we'd love to get some support and come come out and join because the more people that kind of see and hear from the families, the more the more awareness, you know, because it's still just people don't really know what MMIWR or MMIP even is or means. And it, it, it's just that piece in, a, in and of itself um, is really frustrating at times. But um, we ways to get involved would be mis, um, just helping with searches, uh, trainings and volunteer volunteering um, just to like when we post about, you know, a missing relative, oftentimes there's, you know, it's really the family members that try to get people to volunteer to go out and help search for the person. Um, direct support for families and survivors that could be financial. We have a way to donate to our um, to uh, RJIP on our website, indigenousjustice.org. Um, media training, that's the, other, that's the other piece too, is just um, helping our families um, know how to speak to the media and who to talk to and how to talk to them type, um, type of ways. Um, support and healing for impacted families community workshops. Um, there, there's just really a lot of ways to get involved. Go to the next slide, please. So as I said before, our website is indigenousjustice.org. Um, we also have an email there um, and you can contact, um, we can, Morningstar and I are we're a, a two sister show. So we um, we can use any volunteer help at any given time for all of the things and all the events that we're doing. So thank you. Does anybody have any questions or you wanna put them in the chat or let's see. Okay, so people want to know the time and date of the event. So it's five. Oh, wait, here, let me put it in the chat. May 5th. We've also had um, three online Zoom panel presentations um, that I have recordings of if you'd like those. Um, you can get your email to Josefa and I can get those to you, but it was on um, intersections, of, intersections of human trafficking and um, how it pertains to the MMIW crisis. And um, it, it really does intersect, you know, the foster care system, and um, we have three webinars that we just finished and I have those recorded as well, if you'd like that information. Yeah, that would be great, Lisa. I wanna uplift uh, a question that Eli posed. Um, how could he encourage the local papers to cover this issue more? <laughs> hmm. If you have any inside contacts uh, directly with the press, you know, for instance, um, we are having the press show up to our May 5th event, but we have help, you know, it's kind of like um, any kind of behind the scenes, you know, you personally know somebody type thing. Um, it's, it would just be really great just to kind of, you know, talk to them, educate them, um, stay in contact with us because we're always, we're, we're, you know, always out there. Um, Doing doing different do, doing different events and definitely need the press to cover it. I would say contact uh, your local media and ask them mm -hmm. why it is that they um, are not covering missing and murdered stories. I know within um, the Fresno area that we've uh, been helping and supporting the family of. Uh, Bessie Walker, who was murdered um, this past summer in August, and it was her family that was out there searching um, for her on the Big Sandy Reservation. Um, there still has not been um, 
a named suspect in in her murder and so you know with those cases um uh and you know surrounding information um it's really important to um to ask that of of your local media sources and ask why those stories are not being covered There was another question in the chat. I heard colonization in general, um, but how come it seems to be so much more worse in Northern California? Sure. So, I mean, I think that we can look back historically, right, that through missionization, um, through the uh, enslavement and incarceration um, during the, the era of both forts and missions uh, where native peoples were uh, literally rounded up. We were rounded up, we were forced march to various areas from our tribe. We were rounded to the, um, and sent to the Round Valley area. And so they say that, um, you know, the colonization for us is still very fresh, right? We're talking about less than 200 years. And that by the time, that uh, colonizers arrived here to California, that they say, you know, the genocide was very swift and it was enacted in a way where 98% of our populations, um, and, and we relate that to the salmon populations now, right? It's only 97 to 98% of the salmon populations, juvenile salmon populations that have survived. It's the same with us as Native peoples, that there's only, you know, one to 2% of us um, in terms of the, the survival rate. And so that's, there's various factors um, within the webinars. We speak more to the intersections of MMIW and human trafficking and why it is that these intersections exist and, and why it is, and, and really providing some solutions around how to address these um, issues and, and su support like in terms of the larger crisis. Now I feel like I'm turning this into a <laughs> into a panel interview. Um, I was actually just one. I was I was thinking as you were starting to talk about salmon, um, if you could share a little more about the connection, kind of between violence against especially Native women and then extraction and extractive industries and and environmental justice. Absolutely, it's a symbiotic relationship. The flag for our tribe for Pit River Nation is three salmon swimming in, the cir in a circle, and that represents the past, present, and future generations, how dependent we were on the salmon, and that we have uh, traditional stories, just like many other tribes, that, um, you know, if we don't utilize the salmon, um, if we're not eating the salmon, if we're not fishing for the salmon, if we're not drying the salmon as we're supposed to, um, you know, during uh, the summertime, during the salmon runs, um, that the salmon will disappear. And so we are seeing those efforts. I just did an interview this morning on the removal of uh, the Klamath dams and, and the four uh, dams along the Klamath River, how the fish ladders were never unstilled. And so when we talk about, you know, larger efforts around land back campaigns, you know, we also include in um, water back, you know, our ancestors back, that we want our salmon back flowing in our rivers because the uh, health of our salmon populations is, is directly related to our health um, as, as Native peoples. And so, um, you know, there's, there's just so much that, that we could share, but in terms of the resource extraction, I think, uh, you know, a big piece of that is that we don't view water as a commodity. We don't view our sacred salmon relatives as that commodity. We don't see our sacred places as, you know, like, even though we, you know, use the term cultural resources in describing it, that we don't see it through that extractive lens that they are there to protect and they are there for us to be in balance with. And so when we say um, that we are fighting to protect um, and you know uplift the stories of our incarcerated native peoples that we are also fighting to free the salmon. We are fighting, you know, our salmon relatives are, are incarcerated by, by these dams and not able to freely 
swim upstream, our ancestors that are locked in the basements of the University of California, um, uh, you know, departments, um, you know, they are being held captive there. And so it is not only, you know, the incarceration of us as living peoples, but also, um, you know, working for towards the justice and freedom of, of our relatives in many different forms. So Frankie Rose in the chat asked if there would be a Zoom link for the May 5th event, or if there's any virtual option to support. I believe we will have it live streamed. That's usually what we do. We live stream it. Then Julie asked if y'all have a Twitter account. I just put it in the chat, my personal Twitter um, account. We are working on um, additional social media accounts, but there's my, my personal one and we can share the information there. And then we will live stream with that event on the, I had shared the RGIP uh, Facebook link for the event and we will live stream um, the event on that page as well. Willow asked, are MMIWP cases happening more in areas of logging or gas and oil extraction camps in California? Definitely in areas of gas and oil extraction, definitely in areas of logging. And, you know, it's one issue that um, hasn't really been discussed as much in terms of, of cannabis grows. And so we see that, you know, especially within the North Coast areas and those areas of, of Humboldt and Mendocino County. And, you know, the impact on, um, you know, not uh, considered, you know, not unlawful cannabis grows and, um, you know, the number of, of missing native women for sure. All right, if there are no further questions, we could go ahead and thank our wonderful speakers. Um, thank you so much for participating in this and sharing your insight and wisdom with us. And thank you to Josefa for organizing this event. And I'm very appreciative of the language justice component. Um, so thank you to our translators for that as well. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you both. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and jump back into the PowerPoint. Um, and Teddy will lead us in a land back discussion. Can you all see the screen? Perfect. Yeah. So Teddy, Teddy is a member of the Navajo Nation. Um, she leads the ACLU of Northern California's deepening indigenous justice work, focused on building um, mutual and meaningful relationships and centering indigenous voices and worldviews in ACLU NorCal's work. Um, before that, she was ACLU NorCal's first investigator, focused on developing impact litigation to defend and advance um, immigrants' rights and defend against the onslaught of racist and oppressive policies under the Trump administration. Um, and prior to joining the ACLU, Teddy led advocacy and organizing efforts to dis defend the basic rights of asylum seekers and detained immigrants at the US-Mexico border. Um, prior to pursuing a master's in public policy, Teddy spent years in El Salvador where she had the immense privilege of co-authoring and directing Mujeres de la Guerra a documentary film and book honoring the leadership and contributions of rural Salvadoran women. So with that, I'll pass it over to my amazing colleague, Teddy. Thank you, Josefa. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Teddy Simon. Happy to be here with you this morning. I'm so honored to um, share this virtual space with 
Morning Star and, and Lisa and Josefa and all of you. Um, I love seeing the kind of people sharing more about their own stories and connections to these issues um, in, the, in the chat as well. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. Um, I'm just gonna share a little bit um, about the ACLU of Northern California's um, work in support of um, the Amamitsun Tribal Band and the Protect Our Stock campaign. Um, so I think we can go on to the next slide. And maybe before, actually, if we go back to the, the previous slide, sorry, Carlos. Um, I did also want to kind of start by, by sharing a little about the ACLU's growing kind of Indigenous justice work. Um, this is a, a somewhat new area of work for, um, for the organization. Um, and it's, it's really important, um, especially in this area, um, that, we, that we're taking the approach to the work really seriously. Um, so I would say it's, you know, it's my honor and my privilege to be able to share with you about the Protect Your Stock campaign um, and, um, and honor also um, to be able to be a part of this work. Um, in the work that we are doing, we're trying to be really intentional about our approach. Um, and we keep kind of checking in with ourselves and, and, and with our partners and asking, you know, are we approaching this work in a good way? Are we being respectful? Um, are we showing up and are we doing all that we can to make sure that the voices um, that we are listening to and the voices that we're sharing um, and supporting are indigenous voices and indigenous leadership? Um, and um, trying to have some amount of humility and learn as we go and focus on building relationships. Um, you know, there's a, a, a lot of times in, in this work um, for social justice, it's important to be thinking about, you know, what are our goals and how are we getting there? Um, but it's also important to be moving at the pace of relationship um, and not putting our own kind of priorities and goals ahead of, of the work itself. Um, Okay, so now we can move on to the next slide. So the ACLU um, Northern California is a member of the Protect Your Stock campaign. Um, Your Stock um, is the heart of the Amamutsun Tribal Band's ancestral lands. Um, it's located in Santa Clara um, and Santa Cruz counties. Um, it is one of the tribe's last remaining sacred sites that has not been um, quote unquote developed um, or destroyed. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is, um, we had a video um, also of Chairman Lopez speaking, but I couldn't seem to get it to load this morning. Um, so I just wanted the chairman to be able to kind of share in his own words what this place means to the Ama Mutsun. Um, I won't read that, and I'm sorry that the, that slide is, is only in English. Um, but so maybe I will then actually read the last um, the last part of the slide. Um, Chairman Lopez says we want to be able to restore our food plants, our medicine plants, our basketry plants. We want to restore our ceremonies. There's places of power there that we are aware of, and we'd like to return to those places of power, so that whenever we have prayers and needs, we can go to those places and be closer to our ancestors and be closer to Creator. Um, we can go to the next slide. And the next one. Um, so currently um, this land is held um, by a private development um, company and they are in the process of requesting a permit uh, from the Santa, the Board of Supervisors, the County of, of Santa Clara um, to turn Eurostock um, into an open pit sand and gravel mine. Um, the mine would operate for 30 years, um, desecrate the landscape, dig um, four pits hundreds of feet into the ground, pump hundreds, um, thousands of gallons, tens of thousands of gallons of water, which we all know is an incredibly precious resource um, every day, um, and essentially um, irreparably and permanently damage your stock. Um, next slide. Um, this is a, a march that happened um, back in 2019, kind of to draw awareness and visibility to the issue. Um, this was a march that took, um, that started at San Juan Bautista and went to kind of the edge of what is currently the private property um, uh, known as Sergeant Ranch. 
colonization is an ongoing process. Um, and and to, to me, this is kind of the story of the Amamutsun tribal band and Eurostock um, are a really clear example of how settler colonialism continues today. Um, the destruction of Eurostock today would be a, continu a continuation of that settler colonization that began at the time of contact. Um, so for the Amamutsun, um, in many ways this began um, with the, with the missions. Um, the Amamutsun tribal band today are the descendants of, of California indigenous people who were enslaved um, at Mission Santa Cruz and Mission San Juan Bautista. Um, and um, the kind of one of the goals of those missions um, was to completely erase indigeneity and um, what it meant to be an indigenous person. And um, in, in some ways today, if you destroy the land um, that defines a people that, that is ceremony, that is um, the plants and the waters um, that are so critical to um, traditions, ceremonies, belief systems, and identity, um, you are once again attempting to destroy that people. Um, so let's go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so many of you might know about, about the history of the missions in, in California. Many of us don't. Um, we, we don't talk about it. We don't hear about it. Um, the Amamutsen are survivors of the mission systems. Uh, they were really brutal uh, in their treatment of indigenous people um, using extreme violence um, for even the most um, kind of the most mundane transgressions. Um, people resisted um, and they were severely punished for that. Unknown numbers of California indigenous people were, were killed um, at the missions or died um, from mistreatment or disease or neglect. Um, and that was kind of just the beginnings of um, California genocide that continued with the gold rush um, and continues as we see manifesting in, in what Morning Surround needs to share with us today. Um, next slide. So the Protect Your Stock campaign today, the kind of the most immediate or, or kind of short-term goal is to ensure that the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors denies the permit um, for the proposed Sergeant Quarry Ranch project. Um, we're currently awaiting the draft environmental impact report to come out. That's expected in the next month or two, um, but they've been kind of pushing, pushing the ball down the court um, now for a couple of years on releasing this report. Um, and I'll talk through kind of some of the ways in which we hope you all can get involved in this campaign um, in a minute. But the long kind of the longer term goal or the, the kind of the real goal, the heart, the dream, the vision of the campaign and the work um, is to return the land um, to the stewardship of the Alamos and people and to return the people um, to that land. Um, so next slide, please. So the campaign itself um, is about coalition building, following the leadership of the Amamutsun tribe and working closely with um, the tribe's land trust, the Amamutsun land trust. Um, the coalition is made up of dozens of groups, environmental organizations, um, student community groups, faith-based groups. The ACLU chapter in Santa Cruz has been really involved and supportive of this work. Um, it's a lot of individual advocacy, outreach directly to elected officials, going to city council and board meetings, educating people, because we all know so little about all of this and we have so much to learn. And then, you know, organizing and mobilizing, um, once again, returning to hosting rallies and marches um, and events and, and speaking about the issues. Um, and then all the public education um, that we can do. Um, so next slide. Um, and there's a lot of ways that you can get involved, all of you um, here with us today. So the first um, is that we're asking folks to sign the petition to protect your stock. Um, and I think we can drop that link into the chat. Um, the tribe is hoping to reach 20,000 signatures um, before the draft environmental impact report is released. Um, and kind of the plan is um, somewhat symbolically to take that stack of signatories to the petition and deliver it. Um, to the Board of Supervisors to really demonstrate um, that opposition to the mine um, is, um, is strong and broad-based. 
And um, if you have already signed it, um, please share it with all of your contacts, um, not only as a way to get more people to add their names, but also um, to continue spreading the word and educating people. Um, one thing that we that we find, I was just on a, on a different um, training this morning and someone was sharing that uh, even still today in progressive circles, there are people that are surprised that, you know, that quote, Indians are still here. Um, so this, the attempts at erasure have been, are incredibly powerful. Um, and so work to increase visibility, you know, there's very little media coverage of missing and murdered indigenous women. That is that, that's the same kind of impact or outcome um, of centuries of attempted genocide and erasure of indigenous people. So all that we can do um, to share the stories and experiences in indigenous voices um, of, of the, the issues and the resiliency um, is so important. Um, we're also asking folks to sign on, especially if you are um, at an organization or um, a member of a church or a community group um, or any kind of organized body um, to submit letters and statements opposing the proposed mine um, to the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. Um, the protectyourstock.org website, it has a wealth of resources um, and kind of showing, demonstrating that support um, from kind of all walks of life is, is so important. Um, obviously, you can donate um, to the cause. Um, and um, the Instagram and Facebook, the social media accounts, um, um, also re reposting and, and sharing um, what they are putting out. Um, so I think we can go to, the, I think that that's my last slide. Yes. Um, so I will. And there, and just open it up if folks have questions. So there was an interesting question from Randy. Um, doesn't federal government EPA protect native land? Um, that's a great and incredibly um, sad and tragic question. So Morningstar, um, who is also um, free to jump in at any point, um, mentioned um, the tribes in California without federal recognition. Um, the Amamasan tribal band is one of those tribes without federal recognition. And um, so that means um, that unlike tribes who entered into treaties that were respected with the United States, um, in which, you know, tribes maybe not voluntarily, um, but ceded, you know, the vast majority of what is the United States today in exchange for a government to government relationship um, and a federal treaty responsibility, which is that the federal government in kind of in exchange for all of that land agreed not only to respect and uphold tribal sovereignty, but also provide for the well being of Native American peoples. Um, which would be through education, healthcare, housing, um, that the unrecognized tribes in California don't have access to any of um, any of those rights, um, and also don't have kind of formal recognition from the federal government of their sovereignty. Um, and so um, federal laws like NAGPRA, um, do not apply um, to tribes without federal recognition. Um, the California um, CEQA, Environmental Protection Act, um, Environmental Quality Act, sorry, um, does apply um, to tribes in California without federal recognition. And so part of the environmental impact um, review process that I mentioned before includes um, uh, includes kind of a survey of whether there are important culture, um, cultural, traditional, and ceremonial sites um, on the land in question. Um, so the tribe has had input through that process. Um, it is very clear that there are um, important sacred and ceremonial sites at Aristoc. Um, and that is one of the things to be taken into consideration in this process. It's not a guarantee. Um, and the Eurostock is currently held in private hands 
Um, so it's not the, in, in terms of kind of ownership um, and holding the deed and the title to the land is not yet um, in the tribe's hands, but that's a really, that's a really great question. Um, yes, and thank you, Morning Sir. The Amaretsen have been petitioning for federal recognition since 1994. It's an incredibly expensive and political and bureaucratic process. Um, I can't do math that quickly, but I think that's close to 30 years um, of asking a government that um, that tried to um, tried to destroy and erase you of asking you to recognize them. Um, and I think um, Dora put into the chat the importance of making comments on the draft environmental impact report when it comes out. Um, if folks can stay tuned to the work of the Protect Your Stock campaign, um, the campaign um, will be putting together a workshop on writing comment on um, the environmental impact report. Um, it is tentatively scheduled right now for June 2nd, but that may change given that the release date of the environmental impact report itself is um, continues to be a moving target. Um, and to the point about kind of the, the, the goal here is to prevent the mine, but it's much bigger than that, which is um, to return indigenous hands, indigenous lands um, to indigenous hands at Eurostock um, and all throughout what is now known as the United States. Um, there are conservation organizations and other groups in support of the Amamutsun that have come together and said we, um, we are willing and able um, to purchase this land if it were to be put up for sale. Um, the current holders have not said whether they would sell it or not. They would um, potentially make a lot more money um, by turning this into um, into a mine. Um, and so that's why the kind of the political and the mobilizing and the organizing all of that those advocacy efforts are so important um, to continue to put pressure on um, the board of supervisors um, to deny the permit or at the very least kind of continue to draw out this process um, and to put pressure on the, the private owners and private developers um, to to come to the table um, and and if not give the land to the Amamuts, and you're right, that is what should happen, um, sell it um, to the land trust and conservation agencies. Those efforts are happening um, all over the country, both in terms of land kind of being, being rematriated um, here in the East Bay. A lot of that work is happening with Sogorete Land Trust. Um, that is happening um, in, in and around Big Sar land being returned um, up in the far north coast um, with Yurok and other tribes um, kind of reclaiming and rematriating um, ancestral lands. Eli dropped an article that um includes information about how Newsom is proposing to um, pay California tribes $100 million to purchase land back, but also, of course, acknowledging that that isn't nearly enough, especially in California. Okay, if there are no further questions or comments, we could go ahead and close out and turn it over to my colleague, Tammy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Tammy Krasnoy, she, her pronouns, and I am our organizing program associate and uh, colleagues with Josefa and Teddy. Um, so just to wrap up, we can go to the next slide, Carlos. Um, we just wanted to talk about upcoming events this week and what we'll be looking forward to next week as well. So we hope you can join us tonight from 5.30 to 7 for our next educational workshop called What Makes Us Safe. We'll be talking about alternatives to policing and surveillance and how we can really achieve real community safety. And then tomorrow um, from 1 to 2.30 p.m., we are having a workshop called Housing as a Human Right and providing sort of a critical lens about how you can get involved as community members with supporting unhoused um, folks in your neighborhoods, understanding that this is a really wide ranging issue across um, all of California. 
And then looking towards next week, um, we have lobby visits that will be taking place between Tuesday, April 26th to through Thursday, April 28th. So if you're lobbying, you should be getting lots of information about when your lobby visits are and having your lobby captain check in with you. Um, we encourage you to join the Q&A sessions on Monday at 12 or at 5.30 if you have any questions about lobbying, the bills we're going to be talking about, um, anything at all, we encourage you to join those. Um, we will be holding text banks on Tuesday, uh, April 26th and Wednesday, April 27th from 12 until 2 o'clock. And then finally, I'm really excited for our closing celebration Thursday from 5.30 to 6.30. I think we have a really exciting lineup and celebration for that. Um, and that'll close us out. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Thank you to Lisa, Morningstar, Teddy, Josefa for putting this together. Um, and we'll definitely send a wrap up of all the links that were in the chat that we said we would share. And thanks for being here uh, this afternoon with us.